My goal for today is to, uh, to prove a wonderful theorem, which is called Erhard reciprocity. Erhard reciprocity. And uh, first, let me state what I'm going to prove. So, so what we proved in the last couple of classes, I guess I proved this two classes ago, that if you consider this function of counting, let's say that you have a d polytope. You dilate it by, a, by an integer factor of t, and then you count lattice points in there. Right, so. And what we proved is this kind of miraculous property that even though these are kind of the, answer, the answers to different counting questions, you count for the zeroth dilate, the first dilate, the second dilate, and so on, uh, there's this very nice fact that the function turns out to be a polynomial, which is not clear a priori. Okay. This is if the polytope has integer vertices. By the way, the polytope doesn't have integer vertices, then this is not true. Okay. I'll, I'm going to say more about that later. Um, so we call this the Erhard polynomial. Now, I mean, I, I think I actually already told you what the, the content of this theorem is. So, Erhard kind of ca had this crazy idea that if, even though this question was posed for, for positive integers, he wondered what, what would happen if I plug in a negative integer. And then he discovered something nice happened, and that became known as his reciprocity theorem. It turns out that what this is, is, uh, is that it counts the lattice points in the interior of the d of the, of the dilate. Okay. So you take the interior, which we called p with a little circle, and you count the lattice points in there. Okay. And that's what you get when you plug in minus t, except that you're off by a sign of minus 1 to the dimension. Okay. This is uh, Erhard's reciprocity theorem. Question? Read the first section of of, uh, of the book. Okay. Um, <coughs> yes, there there is a connection. Um, okay, so and okay, so here I said this is the relative interior of the polytope. So what I want to do is prove this. Okay. That's, that's my goal for today. We're going to prove Erhard reciprocity. And as has been our strategy with a lot of these things, it turns out that it's a little bit easier to, to do it for cones first and then come back to, to polytopes. Okay. So what I'm going to prove first is the following theorem, which is known as Stanley reciprocity. which is the analogous statement for cones. Okay. So k is going to be a rational d-dimensional cone. With apex at 0. Okay. 
So remember that for cones, we, it doesn't make so much sense to, to count the lattice points. So what we do is that we enumerate them into a generating function. Okay? And we call that generating function sigma sub k. Okay? And it has d variables. But then what I'm going to do is, instead of plugging in z1 up to zd like I usually do, I'm going to plug in 1 over z1 up to 1 over zd. Okay? It turns out that when you do this, what you get is minus 1 to the d times the generating function for the interior. Okay. As rational functions. On z1 up to zd. And I think, before I prove this, I think you should, see, you should see this in action for the simplest example. And then you'll see that this is, this is an, a very nice and, and not trivial statement. So for example, let, let's do it for, for this cone. Okay, just, just in two dimensions, we're going to do it for this cone. Let's call these x1 and x2 instead of x and y. So we have, this is the origin, and then we have all these lattice points. Okay. And so that's what we're trying to enumerate. And while I draw this, you should think about how to compute this thing. Well, in this case, we have only two variables, right? Z1 and Z2. And, uh, and we know that what this is, is that e each one of these points corresponds to a monomial. Like, this one is 1, this one is Z1, this one is Z1 squared, this one is Z1 cubed, right? And then this is Z2, Z2 squared, Z2 cubed. And then, for example, this one is Z1 squared, Z2 cubed. And remember, we actually computed this already in, in several, several times. What we said is basically that if you just look at the x-axis and, and want to add up the points in here, you get 1 plus z1 plus z1 squared, etc. That's just the geometric series 1 over 1 minus z1. So what I, am, what I have here is the generating function for the x-axis, for the x1-axis. For the x2-axis, I'm going to get 1 plus z2 plus z2 squared, and so on. So I get this, and then if I multiply these two things, then I know that every point in this cone can be written uni uniquely as a point on the x1 axis plus a point on the x2 axis. So then when I multiply these two things together, I'm going to get exactly my answer. Okay. Okay. Now what about the interior? What is this equal to? So what I'm, what I'm doing now with the interior is basically just knocking off all the points on the two axes, right? Because this is the boundary. So what do I get? Or how would you do this? That's, uh, so that's almost true. Um, it's almost true. Um, so one thing you can do is just take take this thing and then subtract the x-axis, right? So that's 1 over 1 minus z1. Subtract the, the x2 axis, 1 over 1 minus x2. But then you subtract the origin twice, so you should add it in, plus 1. You get some formula from there. But there's a slicker way, so uh, did you see why it's almost that? 
So the, the, the slicker way of, of doing it is just to, if you cover this up, if you cover the two axes, then you get exactly the same picture, but shift it up. And we know that shifting up and down is very easy because we just have to multiply by a monomial. Okay? So if we just take this, this generating function and multiply by z1, z2, then we're exactly going to be shifting the origin to start here, and we're going to get the right answer. Okay? So I just multiply this by z1, z2, and then keep the rest the same. And that's going to give me the right answer. Okay. Again, with these things, there's, there's many ways of computing the same thing. But if you do it correctly, you should get the same answer. OK, so what is the first statement? What is, what is this statement saying then? This is saying that if you take this thing and you plug in 1 over the variables, so 1 over 1 minus 1 over z1 times 1 over 1 minus 1 over z2, you should get the same thing as this thing, but with a factor of minus 1 to the d. Now, the dimension here is 2, so minus 1 to the d is nothing. So what this is saying is that I should be getting this. OK? And that's somewhat miraculous. I mean, you're, you're going to have no trouble proving this. But, uh, but it's not obvious a priori that, that this is equal. Let's just check it to be sure. So uh, this thing is uh, z1 over z1 minus 1. And this one is z2 over z2 minus 1. right? And then you just flip the signs of these two things, and you get the same thing. Okay. So this is, this is uh, what this theorem is saying, but it's saying that this is true for any cone. Okay. And that's what we're about to prove. OK. So Well, maybe I'll start by drawing a picture. So let's say that this is our cone. Okay. So maybe it looks like this, I don't know. And then maybe it has a lot of lattice points. Something like that. So this is my cone k. Now, I'm going to use this irrational trick that I discussed last time. Okay? So I'm going to take this thing, and I'm just going to shift it over a tiny bit and push it down by, a, by an irrational vector epsilon. And I'm going to push it away from the cone by a tiny amount, OK? So I'm going to get something like this. OK? And this purple thing is epsilon plus k. And remember that the point of doing that was that we accomplished by choosing epsilon to be tiny and irrational. And, and being careful, we found that The generating function for integer points in, e, in epsilon plus k is exactly the same thing as the one for k. In other words, I'm saying I didn't pick up any, any new lattice points, and I didn't lose any. Okay. So that's what I did last time. But today I'm going to combine it with, a, with another thing, which is now imagine that I, that I shift my cone by exactly the same vector, but in the opposite direction. Okay, so I'm going to now push it out into the into the cone. Okay, so instead of doing this epsilon, I'm going to do that same epsilon but in the other direction. So now I'm going to end up here, and then I'm going to do this. Okay, 
And this thing is going to be minus epsilon plus k, the orange code. Okay? And now you see the point is that if you, if you push this by a, by a tiny bit, then by exactly the same argument that we made last time, you're, you're not really going to pick up any new vectors, any new lattice points. But what you're going to accomplish is that you're going to lose all the points on the boundary. Is that reasonable, at least from this picture? So choose epsilon in minus k, tiny, and irrational. And we said last time what irrational means. Okay. Then we saw last time this, but now what I'm claiming is that if we do exactly the same thing, but with minus, if we shift up by, by minus epsilon, then we're going to get exactly the generating function for the interior of the cone. Okay. Now, how do, how do you prove this in exactly the same way that we proved this last time? So if you, if you look at the proof of this statement last time and, and you just adapt it, you'll see that it, it exactly proves this statement. Okay. And uh, the reason that this is good is basically that, I mean, things like sigmas of k, we know how to compute, right? We, we know how to enumerate lattice points in a, in a, in a cone. We've, we spent the last two classes talking about this. But what we have no idea how to do is how to do it for, for interior points in a cone. But what this says is that actually we can do it for interior points in the, in the cone in exactly the same way as we did it before, okay? And so now that's what, that's what we're going to do. Instead of computing this and this, I'm going to compute this and this. Okay. Now, remember again that we know we know how to compute generating functions for cones, but that simplicial cones are easiest for us because for simplicial cones we have the, that business about this fundamental parallelotope. Right. That's we have that formula. So what we're going to do is we, we can assume that k is simplicial. And for non-simplicial guys, we, all, we, we do the usual trick. We do what we did last time. which was basically just triangulate, okay? So we prove it for simplicial cones and then we triangulate non-simplicial cones. And the thing is that for simplicial cones, We have formulas, right? Um, coming from the fundamental parallel pipette. So this is the formula that we get from last time. We remember that. So remember that the, the top just enumerates the lattice points in the fundamental parallel pipette. And then I have a typo here. What I have is 1 minus z to the v1 up to 1 minus z to the vd. Where v1 up to vd are the generators of my simplicial cone. Okay. So uh, this is the origin. In this case, we just have v1 and v2, but in general, we have v1 up to vd. Okay. So we have this formula for sigma epsilon plus k. And we also have a formula for sigma minus epsilon plus k by just putting a minus here and a minus here. So then 
we want to prove this equality between sigma k and sigma sub k's uh, interior, and then we're going to prove it for these two guys using these formulas. Okay, that's the plan. So let's just plug in and see what what it is that we get. Okay. So so let's plug in the left hand side. Sigma k of, of that is equal to sigma epsilon plus k of the same things. Okay. Um, and then we use this formula. So we get sigma epsilon plus pi of 1 over z1 up to 1 over zd over these things, but now... We get 1 over 1 minus z to the v1 up to 1 minus 1 over z to the vd. Okay? That's so what I just get if I just plug in instead of z, 1 over z. Okay? And now let's, uh, let's simplify this thing. So here what, I'm, what I want to do is write, you should notice that 1 over 1 minus z to the v is the same thing as multiplying top and bottom by z to the v. I get z to the v over z to the v minus 1. Or minus z to the v times 1 over 1 minus z to the v. So I'm going to take each one of these things and write it like this. So you see, well, I get this. I get here this thing. I'm going to just leave it alone. Okay. But now each one of these things converts into something like this. So for example, the first one gives me a minus z to the v1, and then I get over 1 minus z to the v1. Okay. Then the second one gives me another minus, so then now that becomes a plus z to the v2 over 1 minus z to the v2, etc. And every time I introduce a new term, I get a new minus sign. So in other words, the signs that I get are minus 1 to the d. And I get all of these factors, z to the v1, z to the v2, up to z to the vd, over this. OK? So that's just some computation. But what that does is that it, it it gives me an expression for the left-hand side of, of uh, Stanley reciprocity. Okay. Now, what about the right-hand side of Stanley reciprocity? Well, let's plug in and see what we get. So the minus one to the d stays there. And now. Again, the nice trick is that, that sigma of the interior of k is equal to sigma of minus epsilon plus k. So I get this. And then I use, I use this formula. That expresses this in terms of the fundamental parallelotope. I get this divided by 1 minus z to the v1 up to 1 minus z to the d. Okay? Now remember what we're trying to do. We're trying to, do the, we're trying to prove that these two things are equal to each other. And maybe our dream was that we would get exactly the same thing here. And uh, that, didn't, that dream didn't come true. But at least, at least to some extent it came true. I mean, 
Um, these things look look like each other, but they don't. They're not exactly the same. Okay. So if we want to prove that they're equal to each other, then what do I? What is it that we need to prove? Um, We need to prove basically if you want to set these two things equal to each other, you see they have the same denominator, so forget the denominator. They have the same minus one to the d, so forget that also. And so what we want to prove is that sigma of epsilon plus pi evaluated at one over z one up to one over z d. Okay. Times this thing, which is z to the v1 plus dot 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 plus vd. So that's what I get from the left hand side. I'm wondering whether that is equal to what I get over here, which is sigma of minus epsilon plus pi of z1 up to zd. Okay? That's what I need to show. Any questions so far? And so, what are we talking about here? You see, that this thing is the um, generating function for points in the parallelepiped shifted down by epsilon. And this one uh, enumerates the points in the parallelepiped shifted up by epsilon. And then we're just saying that they're basically the same thing with a correction term. Okay. Let me say a little bit more precisely what this is. I can erase all of this stuff now. I just need to prove that statement. So we want to prove that these two things are equal to each other, right? Let me put it in a different color because I don't, I don't want you to think that we know this already. We don't know if these two things are equal to each other, okay? But we know what they, what each one of them is, right? So this is the sum over points in minus epsilon plus pi intersect z to the d, okay? So in other words, lattice points in the fundamental parallel of pi pit. And then this is basically z to the p. Okay, this is just the, the enumeration of the, of the lattice points in this parallel of pipette. And what about this? Okay, so this one is the summation over lattice points in this fundamental parallel of pipette. Okay. But now you see, instead of my variables being z, they are 1 over z. Okay? So instead of getting z to the q, what I get is 1 over z to the q. Yeah? And then z to the v1 plus dot 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 plus vd. Okay? And this is good because I don't know about you guys, but these, are, these fractions were making me uncomfortable because in, in the right-hand side we had no fractions. And on the left-hand side, we have fractions. But now, this is going to deal with that problem. Okay. So now let me take this, and then instead of 1 over z to the q, I'm going to write z to the minus q. Okay. And then, this is what we're trying to prove. Okay. So if we want to prove that, then we might as well prove this. Okay. So now, let me make a little bit more space here. Z to the V1 plus dot 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 plus VD minus Q.
OK, so what am I going to do now? Let me draw for you the fundamental parallel pipette with, before we do any shifting, without epsilons, OK? So it looks like this. OK? And then it has some lattice points in here. That's the fundamental part of the pipe before shifting. So this right here is the origin. And this right here is V1. And then right here is V2. And if I had, if I had more dimensions, if, if, I, if I was really in D dimensions, then you would have exactly the same kind of picture, but you would have D independent rays V1, V2, up to Vd. OK? Now, one thing that you should remember is that this fundamental parallel pipette is a little bit tricky because the, the bottom of it is, is closed, but the top of it is empty. Remember, we took combinations where you allow coefficients of 0, but you do not allow coefficients of 1. So in other words, this stuff is not really here. Okay. No, that's not good. This looks like lattice points. So that's not there. OK. That's the fundamental parallel pipe. OK, so what is the fundamental parallel pipe shifted by epsilon? Just kind of bring that down a tiny bit. OK, so maybe let's, uh, let's draw this one. So now I shift it down by a tiny bit. So now it looks like like this. OK. So this purple thing is epsilon plus pi. Now, what are, the, what are the lattice points here? You see the, the lattice points? Maybe I, sh I should ask you, going from here to here, did I lose any lattice points or did I, wi did I win any lattice points? I'm sorry? So what could I have lost? I could have lost stuff over here. OK? But we're choosing epsilon to be tiny. And this was open already, so there were no points around here. And if, we sh if I shift by a tiny bit, I, I, I couldn't have lost anything. OK? Now what could I have won? I could have won things that I, that I got here on the boundary. Did I get things on the boundary? Well, no, because I said this was a, a, an irrational shift, so that means that there's nothing on this boundary. What about these two points, V1 and V2? That's a very good point, both of you. This, these points are not here because, because this thing is open. It doesn't depend because the, how do you express this as a combination of V1 and V2? You express it as 0 V1 plus 1 V2. So you need a coefficient of 1. But in the fundamental parallel pipe, you're not allowed coefficients of 1. OK, okay so that's epsilon plus pi. Now let me draw the same picture, but with minus epsilon. OK, so so now I shift this up a little bit, right? So then I shift it to here. I'm going to get something like this.
Okay. So, so what am I saying now? You see, what, what this thing is doing is that it's precisely enumerating the, the points over here. And what this thing is doing is that it's enumerating the, the purple points. Okay. I'm sorry? Right, so, so what I should say is, is that it's, it's enumerating those, but it's doing this funny thing to them. Okay. And, and what is this thing doing geometrically? It's basically saying, by the way, did I, so let, let's, talk about, let's talk about this guy over here. So this is minus epsilon plus pi. Did I lose anything? Did I lose any lattice points going from here to here? I lost the origin. Should I be concerned? Did I win anything? I also won something which is uh, this point, v1 plus v2. Okay. So I lost this one. And I won this one. Okay. So I still have the same number of lattice points, which is good because... because we want we want the correspondence here between lattice points here and lattice points here. Okay. So really, which which points do I have here? I have precisely the same points that I have here. Which points do I have here? I have precisely the same points that I have here, except that I lost zero and I won v1 plus v2. So now what I want you to notice is this, that if I take a lattice point here, and I call it Q, then by the symmetry of this picture, I'm going to get a kind of symmetric point here that I'm going to call P. Okay, And the way that you should think of this picture is that Q is here, and the center of this parallelepiped is right here, and P is symmetric. Okay. So what I want to say is this, that if you take all the points in this picture, and then you kind of flip them over like this, then I get precisely the points in this picture. Why is that? Well, because this thing, this is the fundamental part of the pipette, so there's no lattice points on, on over here, there's no lattice points over here. That's, that's very important, right? And so basically when you, when you do this flip, this part of the pipette is, is symmetric with respect to this point. And so what that flip accomplishes is that it precisely takes zero to this guy. Okay, so it's precisely taking uh, this point, which is present, and this point which, which sorry, this point which is present, and this point which is missing, and it's flipping them over into this point which is missing and this point which is present. Okay. Now the last thing that I want to claim is that if P and Q are symmetric with respect to the center, then what is this point here? This is v1 plus v2, and in general, it's whatever the sum of the vi's is. Okay? So if p and q are symmetric, then this vector, which is v1 plus dot 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 plus vd minus q, equals this vector, which is p. Okay? So that means that this 
geometric transformation that I'm telling you of, of, of just flipping this parallel pipe over. In terms of, the, of the, this uh, algebraic expression, what it's doing is that it's exactly proving this equality. This equality is a very complicated way of saying that this thing is symmetric. And so if you flip it over, then you don't get anything. You get the same thing. Okay. So that proves this. That proves this. And then we get this here. Okay. So that's Stanley reciprocity. Any questions about it? You see, as we advance, the, the proofs end up always being a little bit of manipulation and a little bit of geometric insight. And that's, uh, that's and then translating between the two. So, so we have Stanley reciprocity, and uh, and now what we do is that we're going to prove, having proved this, now we're going to prove that Stanley reciprocity implies Erhard reciprocity. Okay, and we. We kind of know how that goes already. Proof of Erhard reciprocity. We want to prove reciprocity for a polytope, P. P, a d polytope. Lattice d polytope. In, okay, lattice d polytope. So then, I can take the cone. If I take the cone over that polytope, we already discussed this construction. We're going to get a rational cone in one dimension higher. Okay. And then we're going to apply Stanley reciprocity to that cone. Now, because I have d plus 1 variables, I, because I'm in d plus 1 dimensions, I need d plus 1 variables. And I get a d plus 1 here. And I get this. OK? Now, remember that the, the, the very nice thing about this is that when we plug in once for all but the last variable. Okay, so I'm going I'm going to take all of these and plug and plug in one. So that means that I take all of these and plug in one as well, right? Because one over one is one. And I'm going to take this and just call it Z. And so then what I get is one over Z. Okay? And the, the key thing is that, remember, when you plug in sigma sub cone of p of 1, comma, 1, comma, 1, comma, 1, comma, z, what we get is exactly the Erhard series. OK? So what we get here is exactly the Erhard series for the polytope, but evaluated at 1 over z. OK? And what we get here is minus 1 to the d plus 1 times 1, 1, 1, 1. What we get is the Erhard series of the interior of the polytope. Okay. So this is this trick that, that we keep seeing over and over again. And, and maybe we should step back, and, and you should notice that we keep doing the same thing in all of these proofs. So we're saying we want to prove something about polytopes. Okay. We ha always have some kind of polytope thing in mind. And we say, okay, well, this ge machine you're generating functions makes, makes things easier for cones. So then I do it at the level of cones, but because I cannot count points here, I enumerate them with this lattice point enumerator. And I prove the analogous statement for, for the lattice point enumerator. And then I have this theorem that I keep using over and over again, that if I plug in once in all but the last variable of the cone, 
I get precisely my error hard series, which is what I wanted in the first place. Keep doing the same thing over and over again. And you see what I have here? That, that must be our hard versus property. That, that couldn't be anything else because it's, it's, talk, it's relating the hard series of P and of P interior. Okay? And now the last bit of work that we have to do is to take this equation, which talks about Erhard series, and translate it into that equation, which is about the Erhard polynomials. Okay? And that must be a little bit of, of, an, of playing with the generating functions. Okay? So that's what I'm going to do. So, what is the right-hand side? The right-hand side is, by definition, this is, this is the generating function for the hard series of the interior. So this is just the generating function for enumerating lattice points in p interior, 2 times p interior, 3 times p interior, and so on, by definition. Okay. Now what is, what is this thing over here? Well, this is the generating function for the Erhard polynomial. Okay. Um, so what I get is Lp of t, and then instead of z to the t, I get 1 over z to the t. Okay. And it looks like I'm almost done, right? It looks like instead of 1 over z to the t, let's just write z to the minus t. And it basically looks like I'm done. I should just kind of take coefficients. If I equate the coefficient of, of something here and something here, then I should get what I want. Right? I should get that LP of T and LP of and interior of T are related. Okay? So what happens when I equate the coefficients of, of T of Z to the T on both sides? It's a, it's if you look at it closely, it's actually troublesome because this thing has all positive coefficients, 0 to the 0, 0 to the 1, 0 to the 2, etc. And this thing has all negative coefficients, 0 to the 0, 0 to the minus 1, 0 to the minus 2, and so on. Okay. Have you guys ever seen something like this? I mean, it's, it's, it's precisely the kind of thing that makes analysis troublesome in these things that we're, com that we're considering. This equation cannot make sense as, as, a, as an equation of complex functions because this kind of thing converges for z less, less than 1 and this kind of thing converges for z bigger than 1. So these things have this joint domain of convergence. Okay? And somehow we're saying they're equal to each other. That's kind of strange. But the thing is, remember that each one of these things is a rational function. That's what we proved. Right? We proved that each one of these things is, is some polynomial divided by 1 minus z to the d plus 1, okay? And uh, this is where you see this, that I really did write as rational functions, okay? Because if you try to plug in complex variables here, that's not going to work either. But the point is that this is, this is for, for z less than 1, this is, a comp this is a really a, a rational function. For z bigger than 1, this is a rational function, and these rational functions are the same. So now what we need is a, is a lemma. Actually, I like this lemma, and I, I had never seen it until, until I, I ran into this, until I first learned about this. Lemma. Let's say that you have a polynomial. F is a polynomial. Okay. 
let's say that So we already discussed, I mean, this is your homework, that if you plug in a polynomial into a series like this, you get a rational function, right? So then, it turns out that if you, that if you do this series, which a priori seems unrelated, right? you get exactly minus q of z. A rational function. If you're thinking about domains of convergence, then this convergence is for z less than 1 in norm, and this has convergence for z bigger than 1 in norm. Okay? But it's saying that these two things fit together very nicely in this way. Given this lemma, yeah? Oh, thank you. So this is, this is a series in positive coefficients, in positive exponents, and this is a series in negative e exponents. But it says that if you, if you do these two series, you get basically the same function, just with a minus sign. It's kind of an analysis lemma, really. Um, so if I do this, then I say, OK, well, and this is equal to, this is a polynomial. So I apply that lemma, and I get minus sum for t less than 0 of LP of t to the minus t. And now...